Okay, guys. So you are here for another episode of Amplify Black Voices. I'm pinning the comment right now. Let me see. And Martha will be join joining us shortly with a special guest, actually. That's kind of why we delayed a little bit. We're a little later than normal. So we'll just go ahead and wait for her to join. I will give you guys some of the spiel as we are waiting, as usual. Um, so we are almost done with reading The New Jim Crow. That is the first book we selected for our book club. Um, I summarized chapters five of six, so all five chapters um, of six total chapters. So if you go into our IGTV, you'll actually be able to see the summary there. Our last um, like meeting for the book club for this book, The New Jim Crow, will be tomorrow. And we are actually reading, I'm gonna pull the book out, this book right here. It is called Freedom is a Constant Struggle. Yasmin will be guiding us through reading this book, which will be super exciting because we will have language to draw parallels between two huge human rights crises, one of them being anti-blackness in America, the other being um, you know, the illegal occupation of Palestine. Um, there's other parallels like the South African apartheid. It just kind of helps us talk to our community about anti-blackness in a way that hits home and in a way that relates to us. Um, unfortunately, we do. We need, we need to find ways to make things hit home for people sometimes. Um, so that is the latest on the book club. We'll be starting this book in July. Go ahead and order it. I've heard that it's been kind of hard to get your hands on it, so I would order it ASAP. If you are between the ages of 12 and 21, you can go ahead and order it for free um, through our the link in our bio. So Martha is requesting to be on the live. Hey, Martha. Let's get this started. Hey. Hi. So good to see you virtually. You too. How are you? I'm good. I like the hat. Oh, you do? Yeah, I do. Is it oh, denim? No. It's cute. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, we had a... I'm just trying to make sure I have everything set up correctly before we get started. So how would I send, you know, I want to send the request also to Curtis and Kaylee. Oh, so we can can't. Get... Okay, so we can't request three ways. No. Basically, I thought he was with you. Otherwise, it's fine. He is. Can... They're with me. Oh, okay, yeah. I mean, if they want to come and sit by you, hi. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he has a lot more followers than I do. If you want to do it that way, or it's up to you. What do you guys? What do you guys want to do? Do you guys want to switch it off and call from his, or we can schedule a different conversation with him? It's up to you. Whatever you want. How about we do that then? If you think okay. that the platform will be bigger, let's do that. So you can sign off and then he'll request us. Okay. All right. All right. You know well, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. All right. Hold See your phone. You. Okay. He's grabbing his phone. Okay. So basically the surprise guest, I don't know if you were able to see his face, but uh, he goes by Curtis Roach. If you follow him on TikTok, it's Curtis Too Funny. On Instagram, he's Curtis Too Trill. He is famous for the Board in the House um, videos on TikTok. He grew up in Dearborn. Martha's his mom. I've actually known his mom for a while. It took me like a minute to connect that. The Board in the House um, you know, video that went viral was her son. So she's not only going to share her story, but also um, he's going to share parts of his story growing up in Dearborn, being Black, just kind of the experiences that he had, both positive as well as not so positive in Dearborn. And I think um, we do this thing a lot in our community and where we want to claim people, specifically Black people, as our own once they become famous or once they do things that are deemed respectable in our eyes. But as you'll probably hear from his experiences when he was going to school here, he wasn't really, he didn't really receive that same, I guess, welcoming feeling that that people are giving him now that he's kind of, you know, gained some fame. And I don't say that to put anyone on blast. I say that because it's true. And obviously this series is called Know Better, Do Better and can't really do better unless we understand really what's happening behind the scenes. So we'll wait for that request to come through if anyone has questions, as usual, I'll try to get to your questions. I see someone is excited about our book. We're really excited, too. 
make sure you order that ASAP. And if again, if you're between the ages of 12 and 21, um, you can get that for free through our bio. Okay, let's see. Oh, okay, his phone died. So we're just gonna call back in regularly. Okay. Sorry. It's Don't be sorry, it's fine. Okay, so I wanna know everyone's, I know your name, I know Curtis, and then we have another guest with us today. I'm Kaylee. Hi. <laughs> What's your name? Kaylee. Okay, nice to meet you nice all. You. Thank you all for being here. Hey. <laughs> I just gave everybody the intro. It's like basically what's going on, the surprise guest. I gave them the introduction a little bit to um, Curtis being the, I guess, name or creator behind the board in the house um, viral video, but also a lot of awesome music. Curtis, I actually found you when you had that clip about um, like the fake Columbus Day and kind of like throwing shade at Columbus Day. And I was like with you. I rocked with you since that video. Um, so I'm super happy that, you know, you're getting um, you're getting a lot more attention nowadays. And congrats so on BET much. yesterday night. I'll let you speak to that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Honestly. <laughs> no problem. No problem. So we're going to start with, with Martha. Um, and I just want you to introduce, I introduced you a little bit, but you've basically touched pretty much every part of Dearborn Public Schools. You've been, um, I think you said you started off, well, I don't want to speak on the order, but I know you were at Howard, you were at Eunice, um, you were at Fortson for a period of time, Dearborn High, and now you're at Cass Tech. And so I just yeah. want you to speak to um, not just your experiences currently in Dearborn, but also your upbringing growing up, in your words, on both sides of Wyoming. So, like I was saying in the bio that my um, my mom went to Ports and graduated in 73. So when she graduated, back then they had really strong, I guess what we would call today CTE programs or the business programs. So, like, there was co-op and et cetera, like, things to prepare you for work if you were not going to go to college. Um, and so she, she was in those programs and got a job with the state of Michigan, like, right out of high school at the Masonic Temple here. Like we know for concerts and things like that, but they had business offices and things right here in the cast corridor, like what we call um, Rush Park, Midtown, all that stuff now. And so um, she met my dad there and he was five years older. He was a Wayne State student. Um, and so like their story went on, whatever. And, and then here comes me. So for it, it was just this uh, very interesting um, experience having growing up, grown up here in the city. Uh, I grew up on the northeast side of Detroit, but mm -hmm. she grew up on the east end of Dearborn, and um, that was I, I can't I can't say one influence was more um, important or life changing than the other because I was equally um, in both both sides of uh, Wyoming on both sides of Wyoming. Because my family all lived out there except for my mom. She was almost like the black sheep, forgive the expression, but because mm. she could not live in Dearborn if they wanted to at the, wow. at the time. So can you talk more about what the race dynamics were at the time? In the, in the late 70s, early 80s? Mm -hmm. um, so I remember I was I was not aware of like uh, the the restrictions on parks like Girls Point has now, and things like that. But I knew that there were, um, you know, they they start putting curfews like at Fairlane and like you couldn't go to the city parks unless you were um, a, a resident and things like that. And it was, it was like one of my really good friends, um, his dad used to mentor me, and he. He passed away a few years ago, but he was he was big influence in my life. And he used to say, you know, this is why. Um, and he started explaining. My dad didn't get into it as much, but I just know that his mother, his grandmother, his family was very like uh, Detroit oriented. Didn't realize that they didn't have a choice but to be. So mm -hmm. they bought their cars here. They bought their homes here. They only shopped in the community, etc. But I didn't realize until I um, actually watched. And, and read more about as a result of like experiencing the mosaic view theaters. Um, uh, which one was it? It wasn't crossing eight miles, crossing eight miles, another good one, but it was, uh, 
the play what was it called the one that focused on like the right the riots in 1943 Hmm. and so the redlining and um the steering and things that happened like when there was that emigration up from the south when um black people were coming up from the south to have like that that whole renaissance to like you know rediscover themselves and like what they might want to do within the arts or different trades or different um professions etc and there was just no opportunity down there uh they would come up and they came through that michigan you know that train station on michigan that just has been standing forever but now it's becoming pretty iconic mm. and people see it but they'll, those stories are tied to that um to that journey that they had so to speak um and but they had been here they were natives of the country for a couple hundred years 300 in fact at the time um ancestors ancestors but their identity was very much watered down Mm -hmm. um and what they knew their opportunities were it was very limited even we're talking the 60s 70s early 80s and obviously we can like point to things now that there's still serious injustices that happen um um or that exist and they could be in the form of the microaggressions or lack of opportunity where there's like okay a loophole here and there but you still don't see the representation of people of color in um, all the various uh, fields, et cetera. So yeah. like that, back then it was real blatant. Like it was on the deeds. Like you can't sell your house to a black person. Um, I know that my family told me stories from, my grandmother graduated from Fortson in 1950 and her brother in 1949, they were um, children of Italian immigrants. And uh, so they knew that they couldn't like, there were on the deeds you couldn't sell your house to a person of color, a black person. Mm-hmm. It was very, very explicit. Um, so they were kind of indoctrinated with that belief system and then mm-hmm. that sort of thing. And, you know, sometimes you see glimpses of that now when you have a predominant community that is not necessarily white. Right. Um, but, you know, like my, what I connect with is how it just, um, you know, the, especially the Arab community in Dearborn always resonated because I felt more accepted as a person that of color and because the, the the cultures just seemed to remind me, you know, with the Italian, with the Italian upbringing that I had as well. So, so there's this um, whole, there's this whole history that we're coming basically. And by we, I mean the Arab community, most of the Arab community in Dearborn came and kind of didn't really witness a lot of the, the atrocities or like the overtly racist behaviors that were happening. And, you know, um, I think really my question is around people who don't think that that racism or that racist history in Dearborn still exists today, because maybe we're not talking about it as openly. Yeah. What would you say, being someone who, who grew up during that time or obviously had deep roots um, in this community and heard those stories, but also someone who's kind of raised kids in this community, what would you say to people who don't feel like that's still there or things have gotten tremendously better? I said tremendously, and that reminds me of Trump. So <laughs> you stop using, are using that, Edward. But yeah. Um, yeah, so to people who think that things are just great, we had a Black president, everything is good, Race, racism isn't real anymore. What would you say to them specifically through your experiences recently? So growing up, I didn't realize it, not from the Arab community. I did not feel that. I started to realize it, like how the, it was tied, um, it, the racism with those hierarchies in America, especially with um, white Americans versus people of color. Mm-hmm. Um, that existed and it started to make sense as to why certain things were the way that they were. But it wasn't until I was old, I remember this, I used to play at Woodward's. They used to have a park because it was a K-8 school Mm -hmm. um, back in the 80s. And so I remember uh, this girl that lived down the street was a little off a rocker, but she was one of my friends, you know. And um, one day she snapped, and my sister and cousin were with me. They were much younger. She was throwing rocks. I told her to stop throwing the rocks, and she continued. And so I was like, "You, you need to stop or, you know. And then she threw one at me. So, I mean... You know, that wasn't a good situation because I felt responsible for my um, younger sibling, cousin, whatever. Um, But they wanted to stay at the park and play. And I'm like, we need to go. We need to go. 
And uh, so anyways, it was resolved. I mean, like, whatever, it was fine. Um, and when I walked home, my grandmother, who lived on Turnus, on the corner of Turnus and Hubbard Drive, um, who helped to raise me, said, you know, we were telling her the story. And she was like, you know what? Next time you go back, you tell those sand niggers that mm. they don't have the right to do this or that to you. And I looked at her. Wow. This was my Italian grandmother, who was a... Uh, who, who, you know, was a, a avid supporter of everything with the UAW, the unions, et cetera. She would like protest when the Ku Klux Klan had come to the what we called the Civic Center back in those days. Wow. Um, to and, and she was a, a staunch opponent of like, I mean, anything that had to do with the Klan or, or even Republicans. Like she, you know, when she found out Frank Sinatra was a Republican, I thought she was going to die that day. You know, because <laughs> like, oh my God, but like, Grandma, relax. So. Anyways, um, that's what she was, uh, she said that, and I'm like, that's not a word I would ever say, you know, that's mm -hmm. what people call us, you know, and I, I hadn't been called that, but I knew that much that I knew, like, you know, growing up in Detroit schools, especially at that time, that was, like, very much part of our curriculum, like, we understood history, like, more inclusively than we, these little samples that we get from right. other mainstream education, so, um, and to hear that term, and then again, to hear it like throughout my teenage years and in college, like with regard to other um, ethnic groups, that's when I started to become more aware of like, oh, my God, like there's just so much of it that exists. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't my experience with the Arab community, so to speak, when I was. But I also look a lot different than a lot of other black mm -hmm. people. I don't know that I would like stand out at Hemlock as someone that's so different. And maybe, you know, if someone was taught that black people could take your children. Like some, you know, people would t tell me that well, we were taught in the old country this day. It's just these things that you you bring, you bring with you. Um, mm -hmm. What you don't know, you do fear, right? Yeah. And so, um, but I didn't experience that. It wasn't until I started working in the district and it was just isolated incidents um, that when I noticed like when my son Curtis, when he was in, in elementary school, he was only invited to one birthday party mm. and that was heartbreaking to me. Um, or having, when he, he went all the way through Bryant, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, a lot of his close friends, ex, especially when he ran track and played football, you know, like he had friends of all different backgrounds and, um, but he still was not included largely in a lot of the activities. Mm -hmm. And the kids didn't come to my house either. And I was a person who worked in the district, you know, so, wow. um, <clears throat> and I know that there's a lot that goes into that with regard to like trust and understand knowing, and I'm very protective. I have a daughter now, but I think it's today. Oh but... yeah. Happy birthday, Ava, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, happy birthday. Um, but yeah, you... I mean, but it was just like, ah. And then just to start to learn more and more. And uh, like I was telling you before, I understand being ethnocentric. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the point of like being um, like discriminating, like because I don't believe that there's any boundaries on like what the universe or God brings you. And like, especially when it comes to like, you know, the relationships of people that you meet in your life for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Right. Or you, you people said that you love. I knew that my son would be, he would, be confronted with a lot of issues if he were to mm -hmm. want to be with someone who was of Arab descent, um, right? Having grown up there, so that yeah. was very disheartening. There's, it's definitely more than ethnocentrism because I, I mean, Dearborn High's demographic is white, Arab, and black, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure black black students are the minority, but I'm sure that the Arabs weren't keeping that same energy when it came to the white peers or friends i'm sure they were allowed at their houses i'm sure there was there was a like and this is me guessing just based on what my experience has been like but one question i had you and i spoke a little bit about this earlier but around this um you said something paralleling the lebanese community in dearborn to what you've seen in the italian community with this desire to um i can't remember exactly how you worded it but basically embodying the oppressor and if you could speak to that i'd love for you to define for people listening, what does that even mean? What does that look like? And why is that problematic? And I guess like examples of ways that you've seen the community do that. 
Um, so there are a lot of times where people, um, today will say, you know, just like now, and I, I haven't lived in Dearborn in three years. I haven't worked in the district in three. Um, but people feel like they can, um, say things to you that are, um, extremely inappropriate, assuming that you're not, because you're not of that specific background that they have permission uh, to be biggest and air out whatever they're confused or ignorant about. And so I don't, I don't do that because if you do it, then you're giving them permission. Like you're agreeing with them. Even if you're like, mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And you don't say anything because if you're uncomfortable, but um, saying nothing, uh, a lot of times people think that you're agreeing with that perspective. Mm -hmm. And I just want to be very clear, but I do have knowledge that goes behind like what I actually, um, combat like some of the perceptions or assumptions, et cetera, with. Um, and I often feel like when someone like I was r like renting a condo that was within this really beautiful unit and this woman um, that bought it, her and her husband, wealthy people from out of the area bought it and they made sure all of us had to leave so they could sell these units and none of them sold yet. But anyways, um, and it's been a year and a half. But anyways, uh, she was the, the property manager is a property man. I mean, he's from Dearborn. Uh, and she was blaming everything that had gone wrong on the property manager and the management and saying that the person she spoke with, you know who he is, said his name. And she was like, you know, and he wouldn't even talk to me. He only wanted to talk to my husband. But you know how Arab men are. You mm -hmm. know, and it was like one of those things. You know, that's just one example. I, I've heard it throughout my life and I always have to have the conversation I'll, I'll redirect one more time and then like it's either like you know I'm gonna like go go at you or I'm gonna walk away so I don't end up in jail or something stupid right and so um yeah so I said well actually that's where people I said my experience has not been that of course there's people in every ethnic group that um reflect these like you know, the patriarchy or like their own insecurities. So they want to try to act like they're better, male, female, black, white, Arab, Mexican, whatever it may be. But right. when it comes to people, um, there's a lot of um, cultures, minorities, people of color, and there's just so many of them in America um, that start to take on the, the ideals, the perceptions of the larger community, which and it's, it's white America and it's white men. You know, so until um, just, what was it? Not even like, I'm not even a whole generation removed from the fact that. Even, even Arabs were not allowed to buy houses in Dearborn in certain neighborhoods until some time had gone by. You know, most, most uh, Syrian and Lebanese immigrants were either in Highland Park or in the South End of Dearborn until they can move to the East End. Right. And that's right? Not, so that's, that's, yeah. that's where they were relegated, you know, and, and that sort of thing. And it's like the South End is one of the most beautiful parts of Dearborn, like because it's so rich in history um, and such a, such a strong community. But, you know, that part I know. And then like now you have, you know, Black Americans that for generations and hundreds of years have been here ancestors etc and the country was built on their backs and they were like forbidden to live in most communities even within the city of detroit right right until the civil rights act and, and things with real estate had passed in the 60s because of so much mm. and that's um, that's mainly that's what that's what is has been getting my wheels turning a lot is just the idea that our parents and our grandparents immigrated here without knowing that backstory and obviously right. america's doesn't want to teach us that so in our minds it's like well we started from nothing too and yeah. I hate that. I hate that mentality and I reject it I also understand why people mistakenly and ignorantly think that it's that we can draw parallels as Arabs to what the black community endures because we're erasing a whole 400 years of basically oppression plus yeah. you know and so I guess the the point that I try to make that I've been starting to make is just that, yeah, like sh my dad started on ground zero. He didn't, he actually didn't have anything. He came here, he built from the ground up, but the black community is not starting on ground zero. There's, it's not only building their way to ground zero, but there's just different systemic barriers that we didn't have to endure. And I think that's the point that I'm wondering 
if you can speak to is even if we are welcoming in certain ways, like what are the ways that we as a community from what you've seen are perpetuating this issue of, you know, playing that oppressive white person, even though we're never going to be white and, you know, ultimately leading into the oppression of the black community? A couple ways, like a couple low hanging fruit, so to speak, would be um, like when when my son Curtis started middle school, I used to tell him because I hear it, you know, working in the schools and I would I could have conversations with students and they were just speaking what they heard. Right. That's right. how kids are. That's what I love working about kids, working with kids. So. But like when they would say um, Abed or Abi or whatever, mm -hmm. um, I knew that that was very derogatory. Because you're implying that these black people are slaves, right? And you're not speaking about it in a religious in a religious exactly. sense, like it's often the deflection, and it's very offensive. And so I would teach students that, right? They didn't know; mm. um, they were repeating what they heard. Um, so when I told him that, I said, "You have to listen for that. If people do, and you know, laugh or whatever," I said, "I don't think it'll happen often, but if it does, I mm. want you to be able to confront that and say, excuse me." I'm not anyone's slave because like, it's, it's just a lot of work the community has done. Like black people have done to at least have some sort of a voice place. Look at 2020 and finally things are changing because of so many atrocities mm -hmm. and the universe shifting the way it had, like with this pandemic, et cetera. So we're still fighting these same fights right. for equal rights, for just human liberties, right? Mm -hmm. in, in the free country, the greatest country in the world, supposedly. Um, and so when, when you say that and like not knowing, um, it's just putting that same head on like that perception. And if I just like with my grandmother, an Italian person who their people were treated this way in New York and other places that they immigrated to, um, when you, when you take on that identity or you take on those perceptions, you're hoping that, um, the larger community accepts you as one of them. Right. If you'll do that plantation thing, that chicken George overseer, like I'm going to go against my people, mm. um, like homegirl who's trending. What's her name? Uh, that Candace, what's her face? Candace. You know, her, like she's out here speaking and like with her, like Trump. Stuff. Okay, like fine. It's not to be political, but I'm just saying like she's just ridiculous. Like no, you can be political, yeah. Thing, and it's extremely offensive. It's even more offensive being someone that she's someone of color like are you serious um but so yeah so so people think well if i hold on to this and i i think i've done it in my life you know i've been I, i've been put in positions to have to enforce certain things so people's hands are clean right when they're enforcing policies that are largely oppressive to black <clears throat> and in dearborn arab students right right um, and so, like you said, with your book that you guys were, were talking about, when you know better, you do better. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's about learning. So that, that's one, that's one of the ways it's just yeah. adopting people adopt an identity in order to fit in so they can have a comfortable life. They can attain the American dream. You don't and have they're to never, they're the never that though. of that's other it. people. They're sold on a dream. It's BS. They're sold on a dream. They're not, no one's going to look at, no, if anything, I've seen situations where members of the Arab community play that role, right? Where they're selling right. and no one respects them. Not even people that they're trying to gain respect from. But there right. was this, um, I remember I was teaching this, basically this concept when I was a teacher to my students. And there was a lyric that I had found. I don't remember the song, um, but it was a Jay-Z lyric. And he basically likens this issue with the black community to crabs in a barrel. And he says something mm -hmm. to the effect of, if you put crabs in a barrel to ensure their survival, something like you're gonna you're gonna end up tearing down someone who looks just like you and that visual yes. in itself changed everything for me because it's we're in this barrel of the american dream and we're basically in order to get out and escape even though you really can't you're you're you have to pull other people down on your way up and it's just this disgusting myth this lie that we've been told and yes. personally i just i hate seeing it i hate seeing like one of the things that changed my perspective too was just the color like the progressive, how we get progressively darker from um, West Dearborn. So that's the, you have the white community, then you have the Lebanese Arabs, then you have East Dearborn onto um, Southwest Detroit, onto the East side of Detroit. And it's progressed basically the Arabs, the Latinos and the black community and how we've become this strategic barrier 
between the white community and the black community and how mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're basically pawns and we're letting ourselves be pawns. Now. Yes. Yes. Oh my God. That was said perfectly. Pawns. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, if, if someone is in a position of power and they happen to be, and this is, I'm not, I'm not even about to apologize again. I'm, I'm just going to say, obviously I'm not anti-white. Okay. I'm just, this, this is history. This is historically based. Right. But even if someone um, not knowing, they just know what they know, and they have any power to oppress people of color, whether it be Arabs, Muslims, um, black people, Latino, like whatever you, you want to call women a lot of things. Now we use women to like oppress other women. That's like the, the big thing, too. Um, you have... If you have that that happening um, and, and you are in a position of power, a lot of times you do use these pawns, these people that look like the ones that you're trying to oppress um, so that your hands are clean of it um, wow. and, these, and, and people don't even understand that this is what's happening. They're being used. They're right. being used like they used to take uh, when they would like take, they would steal kings and queens from Africa mm -hmm. and put them on st slave ships and, and, and not even knowing that this is what was happening. Right. You know, um, the, the village was bamboozled. They thought that they were going over to a new world, like to have different opportunities to work and a new discovery and this and that. And um, then it was like the whole bait and switch thing, you know, once they were actually on these slave ships for days and weeks and weeks and weeks. And they would use the people who were the elders or the griots or the people that were leaders in their communities and their villages and their, their towns within Africa to um, basically um, convince the others that there was no, so that there wouldn't be an unrest. There wouldn't be uh, an Amistad situation with every single ship that sailed right? because there was, that's how you do it. You get into the minds of those that are trusted, those that might look familiar, and you use them to further the agenda of the oppressor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's crazy. You, um, We talked about something earlier that might help people see these dynamics specifically as it results, as it compares to the communities interacting with each other, the Black community and the Arab community. Um, and a daily interaction that we all know good and well is the Arab gas station owners or liquor store, and liquor store owners and the black communities that they serve. And um, when we spoke, I, I told you about this conversation I had with this gentleman in Atlanta who's black. And he was saying that he finds it funny, not even funny, just kind of offensive that a lot of these gas stations or businesses are owned by Arabs in black communities, but they don't even have the, you know, the consideration to hire members of that community. But even without right. that, just not even respectful towards the communities that they serve. And immediately when he said that, I just thought about Dearborn, even Detroit, you know, like you said, Romulus. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any, any like, uh, you know, southeastern Michigan, like, I mean, that's where I was born and raised. I've never lived outside of it except for in East Lansing um, when I was at state. <laughs> um, but other than that, like, that's just been my experience. And so... Um, it wasn't until I was working in the district and there were progressives that had power to like, you know, enact some ch some changes and participate. Um, and I forget what it was called, but there was always this, uh, this luncheon during the fall and I would take students and we would talk about the diversity issues. And it was a unifying event, mm -hmm. but just to hear people that were like my dad's age and he was born in 1950, like for him, you know, them to say, I can't even get a, a bag at a gas station. I can't even get, like my change back. I don't care if it's seven cents. If it's my change, I want it back or whatever. Like I was telling you earlier, like when I was a little girl, there's a party store up on the corner. Um, and I grew up at like state fair and outer or, uh, the Quinder area. And it was a Chaldean owned store, you know, and they would just have like the, the, the porn, the porn magazines out and like, you know, the, the junk that we would buy that was marked up a whole bunch. So that was our only interaction. Innocently, I didn't see it as like this person or that person or this culture or whatever. I just was like, well, I mean, that was all I knew, right? right. Um, and so, but, but to hear other people's stories and stuff like that, and I'll be honest, like after 9-11, that's when I was like, I had to have a conversation with my dad because I was very careful. I lived in Warrendale, like, and, and my Arab neighbors, they were Iraqi immigrants, 
um, they they looked out for my son like he was one of their own, right? And like genuinely. Um, and so people were putting their flags up and I understand like they wanted, you know, the propaganda and all you saw was the loops and loops and loops and, and loops. And it was very scary because in our country, this doesn't happen where people get attacked and, um, and things like that, like happens in other places all the time. Um, so they were hanging those flags. I, you know, you were a little girl that you may not remember. So everyone's putting their flag up. Okay. That does, I, I'm not anti-American. It's just, you know, I was like, I'm not doing that. And I have one. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't want my neighbors to feel uncomfortable and I was projecting. I didn't know if they would have felt uncomfortable or not. Um, but I know that the day after it happened, they were in tears because it was a place that they had coveted as well. You know, this country was as much in their heart as it was any of ours. You know, they right. came here and it was an opportunity to become whatever yeah. that was, right. you know, to be, to have, to have better, not a lot of things just to have better. Yeah. And I can't speak of their experiences in their native countries, but, um, I had so many neighbors from so many different places, but I just remember my Iraqi neighbors specifically with regard to that. And um, they were, and they were in tears and it was scary. Like I, my students, I taught in Farmington at the time and my students uh, in my, my uh, ELL class, we call it transitional English at the time. They were, they were from these villages that, you know, then were under attack for what was it over 10 years? Mm -hmm. I forgot the countdown. I remember I used to watch it on MSNBC every night. But but for years and years and years, as a result of the 9-11 um, situation, and there wasn't an Iraqi that was involved in it at all, <laughs> um, there was just, you know, now everything is getting there. They were under attack for many, many years, and so many civilians died. And we right. barely heard about that. Um, and so I could empathize. Like, I could feel that. So fast forward now, I'm, I'm a person who's now teaching back at the high school I went to. Um, and I, and, 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 and I, don't, I don't think I have a single student that's bigoted towards anyone. They have no power, so mm -hmm. I couldn't call them racist, even right, if they exactly. didn't say anything. Right. But I correct them, I go, it's not Arab. You mm -hmm. know, it's not this, it's not that. And like I was saying, we talk about like, well, do you ever say hello when you go into a store? or whatever you know if it's just like let me get this or let me get that then this has become like a you know a, a norm the yeah. way that people <laughs> the the way that people just interact and um and that sort of thing so yeah and, and without knowing that there's a human behind that glass and they have a story and they have a family and they have whatever. And so they're not, they don't see it in the, on the other side of the glass. They're not seeing it, but I happen to be able to sit in the middle and I know. Yeah. And so I love to be able to just teach and teach students and like show them like even like their misunderstanding with regard to um, Islam, for instance. Um, and I, and I taught, you know, show them how, you know, on the map of Africa and I'll bring it down. There's 17 countries in you know northern africa that are that are muslim um countries or they're arabic arabic speaking or when you go all the way back to where the gold coast was where the slave trade had begun most of those people were muslim or they were indigenous in some way i go let's just watch roots want to do that let's read it <laughs> well right. we'll even start with the lion king if you want yeah right. yeah no it, it's it, i think it's really interesting how you just spent you know basically the last response defending us and one thing that i hear especially you know since more media um more people are in quarantine and are thus you know forced to pay attention to the black lives matter movement even though it's it's been going on and these issues have been going on and none of this is new um people are starting to have all of these opinions specifically within the arab community and i can call it out oh. around um you know, like, why are you, what they defend us? And it's just like, first of all, you don't, you don't, it's not about what they, de like, you just do things because it's the right thing to do. That's number one. But number two, yes, like, this, this has been a point I've been making, specifically as someone who believes that both Detroit and Dearborn are, are my communities at this point, having worked in Detroit for a few years, and having a lot of friends who grew up in Detroit, those are the main people that anytime, you know, I needed some sort of advocacy. I don't know if you remember when my dad, um, well, basically, when they had a school board meeting in Dearborn to get two buildings named after my dad, my black yeah. friends were the ones that showed up. 
you know, my Arab friends too, the ones uh -huh. in Europe, that's expected because they, his legacy meant something to them. But my what? friends who've never, you know, even touched Dearborn, Dearborn didn't really mean anything to them. They had never met my dad, were the ones that showed up and advocated. When I had an incident with a professor at my university who said something really racist about Palestinians, it was my black friends who drafted a letter, you know, to that professor asking him to apologize. And it just sucks that you have to say stuff like that. It sucks that you have to show these receipts of how black, the black community is always so welcoming and accommodating of everyone else's issues. But that's part of the history too, that it makes me, it gives me mixed feelings because sometimes I don't feel like we deserve it. You know, like <laughs> even with the civil rights era, we wouldn't be here. That's the thing. It's just like, we literally wouldn't be here, let alone be here to be successful enough to then point the fingers at other people if it weren't for the sacrifices made by the black community. Um, so it's just like, it's interesting to me that you're using your platform as someone growing up in both communities to advocate on our behalf mm -hmm. when I don't think enough of us are returning that, you know, just energy, whatever you want to call it. Hmm. What do you think that, why do you think that is? I, I'll say again, I think there's a lot of ignorance and that's like, you know, that ignorance is different than just being stupid. Like ignorance is just, you just don't know. There's a lot of things I'm ignorant about. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and so I choose to learn. Uh, so when people don't, then they are kind of stuck where they are. And a lot of times the narrative is very comfortable for people. So right, exactly. if they're comfortable in their bubble and that sort of thing, and then they can like have a target that they can like scapegoat because wow. that's just like the oldest trick in the book. Um, and, and it could be Arab, it could be black people that are light skinned, but whatever it could be, like it could be all kinds of different, um, groups, but when you have that comfortable narrative and you want to still like propagate these ideas um in order for you to sustain what you think your um your, your position your title yeah. your whatever you are whoever you identify with whatever this identity you attach to yourself then it's very comfortable for folks so that's what i loved i love about being an educator and uh on both sides of wyoming so to speak and that's like where i've spent the bulk of my career um either side is um, being able to share my who I am and who my kids are and um, and 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 caring about people genuinely right and like gaining that trust so and I always say well I'm not the except she might be getting a call or something you cut off for like I, five my battery is dying Oh, it's okay. I'm yeah, I just was. So when I was in Dearborn, I would teach my students to, um, you know, if there was an issue with like something that they said that was inappropriate. Okay, they're kids, you know, they're repeating, like I said before. And so I would teach them, you know, like how their regard for me uh, needed to be uh, transferred to anyone of color that uh, or a black person that they knew. Like, because when you say it about them, you're saying it about me too, yeah. or you're saying it about my son. You're saying it about p things that are very, very close to my heart. And if you regard that, would you want me treated that way? Well, I'm very tangible as far as they knew me. So that made more sense to them. It's just communicating that. And so over time, you know, you know that there's just these little nuggets that you have, these, these moments in time that maybe it, it does stick over the years, right? And the same thing now in Detroit, I do, I say about my students and in and, and my experiences I share, I share so much um, about my experiences in Dearborn and, um, you know, just the people that are very, very close to me and um, understanding, not accusing, not dismissing their experience, but just saying, you know, have you ever considered this or this is kind of the history of that? Um, and being able to substantiate it. And so they got a different perspective, right. you know, with right. regard to what they assume or what they hear with regard to Arabs or if it's uh, Islam or if it's, you know, how you even say it and things like that. And it's, uh, it's always a gift to be able to do that. So it's not necessarily in defense of one over the other. Of course not. It's just they're, you know, humans who are humans. And I don't mean to paint like, um white people with a brush in a certain way of course not like but anybody who understands our history knows that that is just how it's not that anyone who exists today's fault 
that that's what our country was kind of founded on, these ideals that were very much a paradox to what our country was supposed to be founded on and what people were escaping in Britain, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I mean, like you have that and, um, and it is what it is, but when people choose to hold to it, hold dearly to um, those ideals, like they want to fight about like the Aunt Jemima on a dog on pancake box, and Uncle Ben, and like even you can like spit all the knowledge and give them the history and show them There's that. Like, don't believe, don't ask me. I hear this or like whatever, and it's because it's comfortable to you. It's not comfortable to me. Exactly. Exactly. Sorry. So, so yeah. It's so true. So yeah. and then and so when you know when it comes to any larger communities, I'm not gonna allow any community. They like to just degrade. And if I agree. If people are stereotyping Arabs or like people even have said things about black people in front of me not knowing when I was like mm -hmm. a waitress in Dearborn, whatever, you know, free tan. But, you're di but they'll say that you're different, right? But yep. you oh, you're different. not like them because yeah. you, you oh, talk a certain way or you're not this or you're not that. It's so cliche. Yeah. But I love that point of if you're saying it about them, you're saying it about me. That's it. So what yeah. are you going to say about me when I walk away? Mm -hmm. If you're saying this about um, Arabs or uh, Latinos or Asians or whatever it may be, right? You're not gonna say to me like something like as off. I mean, some people are real off the hook, obviously, but like they're not gonna just be so blatant. Yeah. <laughs> the mosquitoes are chasing. I know. Us. I was about to ask to watch. You can see us like running. We can move I on. See, I see you like swatting them left and right. So we can close out. I know you said your phone is dying. But I guess the, the last question I have for you is if you had a call to action specifically, I told you most of our audience are Arabs from Dearborn or even from around the States. Um, but if you had a call to action to Arab communities in all of this, what would that be? Son, if you had a call to action, I this is what Rima asked me. If I had a call to action to the Arab community because that's largely their audience, what would it be like as far as accepting and understanding that we're all individuals and like to get out of that comfort zone? Mine would be to like actually no, like go to the Charles H. Wright Museum, like I always say, mm -hmm. go to the Arab American Museum and do a, a you know a comparison and actually learn learn the history, learn the trajectory of like the immigrants from Syria and, and Lebanon mm -hmm. and the waves of immigration and then the Yemeni, Iraqi and this and that, why people were immigrating. What, what were they coming from? Why were they coming here? Right. A lot of people didn't want to have to leave their homeland. I can't even fathom that, right? For better right. or for worse, it's what you know, it's your community. So why did people do that? And then understand how people were able to, like, try to grasp at that middle class, that American dream, mm -hmm. um, you know, by working at the factories and, and, and things like that. Or, like, just being able to, like, you know, sweep floors at McDonald's like my great-grandpa Luigi would do. You know, the McDonald's that was on Schaefer and uh, Ford there, you know, in, in and forever. And he, and he also helped to build ra railroads and this or that. And so there's always these things. There's, everyone has these stories. Right. Um, so just to understand our stories and don't don't appropriate the culture. You know that. Like, we can't stand it. You can't stand it if that happens. Like, don't be – because I, I, I just have more faith. Like, the community is so much better than that. Yeah. So don't appropriate it. Don't, like, be, you know, busting out Roddy Rich and this and that. Mm. And then, you know, then you don't want to – then you're clinching like a purse when you're coming yeah. downtown. Don't do that. Exactly. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much, Martha. I have to see you in person finally. We've been connected over Instagram for years. And this is the closest to find the hanging out. But hopefully we'll make it happen. We will. Yeah, we definitely have to. I want to thank you so much so much for sharing these stories with us and for sharing some of your family on here with us. Hopefully we'll get Curtis on here to talk yeah. through some experiences. Um, but I'm sure people really appreciated it. Um, we'll have this up on our IGTV. We'll have it up on our YouTube and our podcast as well. So I can send you those so that you could share them. All right. Thank you so much. Thank right. you for having us anytime. Thank you. I'll let you go so, that, so the mosquitoes don't get the best. I know. We're like, oh. 
Good yeah, night. Yeah, see, this is where we're all the same. Who wants to get eaten out by a mosquito right I now? Know. By the river? <laughs> no, I'm and happy birthday again to Ava. Thank you. Thank you okay. so much for having us. Thank, and thank you. you for thank those you. who chose to listen. I appreciate you at least considering. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>